Shalom, everybody. <clears throat> James Trim here again, and uh, we are <clears throat> picking up in the Book of Enoch with uh, Lesson 9, and we're uh, about to start with Chapter 49. Um, we just ended Chapter 48 with the big, uh, big uh, bomb, if you will, dropped on us. Um, that uh, verse 10, in fact, I'll repeat it. On the day of their affliction, there shall be rest on the earth, and before them they shall fall and not rise again. There shall be no one to take them with his hand and raise them, for they have denied Yahweh Zavaot and his Messiah. The name of Yahweh Zavaot be blessed. <clears throat> so the Messiah is specifically mentioned here. The, uh, the chosen one, uh, the... Uh, the Son of Man, uh, the Righteous One, the Wisdom, um, as, as all being identified as the Messiah. And denial of the Messiah is the denial of the name of Yahweh. And you're saved, we learned last week, in the name of Yahweh Tzavaot, who is um, uh, the name that has been given to the Messiah from creation. All right, chapter 49, uh, we're going to get a little bit, uh, you know, last week I ended and tell, told you that we were going to get into how the, why the rabbis suppressed the book of Enoch, and it relates a lot to the material that we already read, but actually I think we'll get two more chapters into the text, and then um, uh, we will get to... Uh, looking at the uh, the reasons that the rabbis admittedly um, suppressed the book. All right, so chapter 49 begins, For wisdom is poured out like water, and glory failed not before him forever. For he is mighty in all the secrets of righteousness, and unrighteousness shall disappear as a shadow and have no continuance, because the Chosen One stands before Yahweh Tzavaot, and his glory is forever and ever, and his might unto all generations. And as we found out last week, on a throne next to Yahweh Tzavaot, and uh, on a throne next to the Ancient of Days, and apparently both share the name Yahweh Tzavaot. And in uh, him dwells the spirit of wisdom, and the spirit which gives insight, and the spirit of understanding, and of might, and the spirit of those who have fallen asleep in righteousness. And he shall judge the secret things, and none shall be able to utter a lying word before him, for he is the chosen one before Yahweh Tzavaot, according to his good pleasure. Chapter 50. <clears throat> And in those days, a change shall take place for the set apart and the chosen and the light of days shall abide upon them and the glory and honor shall turn to the set apart. On the day of affliction, on which evil shall have been treasured up against the sinners and the righteous shall be victorious in the name of Yahweh Zavaot. We keep seeing that phrase. In the name of Yahweh Zavaot, and he will cause the others to witness, they shall repent and forego the works of their hands. And they shall have no honor through the name of Yahweh Zavaot, yet through his name shall they be saved. And Yahweh Zavaot will have compassion on them, for his compassion is great. And he is righteous also in his judgment and in his presence, of his glory and righteousness also shall not maintain itself. Um, at his judgment, the unrepentant shall perish before him. And from thenceforth, I will have no mercy on them, says Yahweh Zavaot. Okay, so we have a handout here. It's actually sort of left out, left over from last week, but it pertains to things we just read also. Why the Yahweh, why the why the rabbis suppressed the Book of Enoch? Now the Book of Enoch isn't found in the um, uh, in the Masoretic text. It's not found in the uh, rabbinic canon. 
Um, it's also not found in the uh, Protestant or Catholic canon. It is found in the uh, canon of the Ethiopic Orthodox Church. And uh, I think we covered this maybe in the very beginning uh, lesson one. It is regularly cited and quoted uh, as being scripture by the so-called church fathers. Uh, and of course, it's cited, it's quoted by J Jude. Um, First Enoch 1 9 is quoted in Jude chapter 1 verses 14 through 15. And it's um, uh, referenced 128 times, not by name, but by material, in at least 128 times in the so-called New Testament. And if we accept that the book of Enoch was actually written before the Tanakh, multiple times in the Tanakh, especially Daniel 7, uh, Psalm 110, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 30, we could just go on and on. <clears throat> But in the Second Temple era, the Book of Enoch was widely used and accepted in Judaism. Seven copies were found among the Dead Sea Scrolls, and the contents of the book were referenced, as I said, by the original Jewish followers of Yeshua, no less than 128 times in the Ketuvim Netzarim, uh, the book's commonly known as the New Testament. Uh, the Book of Jude actually quotes it in Jude chapter 1, verses 14 through 15. Excuse me. Um, so certainly the original Jewish followers of Yeshua accepted this book. Um, usually when you're looking at a book that was used by the church fathers, the so-called church fathers, and used by um, Jewish authorities like in the Dead Sea Scrolls um, and the, even the rabbinic literature, then you can triangulate the origin of that book uh, and how it got to those two sources through the Nazarenes, the original Jewish followers of Yeshua. So um, the books of the Apocrypha, how did the, how did the, the so-called books of the Apocrypha, how did they get um, into the Septuagint, into the Christian Bible, um, originally before they were removed, uh, well, moved to an appendix and then removed, uh, the uh, uh, they were of Jewish origin. So how did they get there? Well, they had to have come through the Jewish roots of the movement. So the original Nazarenes must have used those books. Same thing is true of the book of Enoch, even more so. Okay. Sometime after the close of the second century era, the book of Enoch became suppressed by the rabbis. Rabbi Shimeon ben Yochai, uh, a second century Taniatic sage, uh, one of the Tanim, a uh, traditional compiler of the Zohar. In fact, uh, I think there's good evidence, that's a whole different study, uh, that he was the compiler of the Zohar, at least in its original form. And um, one of the primary reasons for that has been found in these lessons. Of the Zohar and the, uh, makes use of the Book of Enoch regularly, and the uh, um, uh, and references the Book of Enoch by name, and not just making up material, but clearly references material material that's actually in the Book of Enoch. Okay, so. Uh, uh, it was not a, uh, could not have done that if it was, the Zohar was a forgery created in the uh, Middle Ages. Okay, so Rabbi Shomen, uh, Shimon ben Yochai, the second century uh, Ta'anim, who uh, compiled the Zohar um, and used the Book of Enoch in the Zohar, by the way, and was clearly aware of its contents. So he had and knew the Book of Enoch. He indicates that uh, the rabbis of his time period used the book secretly, but supported, uh, suppressed it for fear that laymen might be misled by misunderstanding it. Zohar, Volume 1, page 72b, Rabbi Shimon said, excuse me, had I been alive, 
when the Holy One, blessed be he, gave mankind the book of Enoch and the book of Adam, I would have endeavored to prevent their dissemination because not all men uh, read them with proper attention and thus extract them perverted ideas such as lead men astray from the Most High to the worship of strange powers. Now, however, the wise who understand these things keep them secret and thereby fortify themselves in the service of their master. So Shimon here is saying that in his time, the rabbis had begun to suppress the book of Enoch, used it themselves for their own wisdom, but they didn't trust you with it. You would only get confused and uh, drawn aside into the worship of strange powers. And um, that word powers is interesting because in our handouts in our last study, we discovered uh, that the, uh, uh, the, the, the Nazarenes and the Pharisees would debate about uh, Daniel chapter 7, uh, verse 10, uh, I believe it is, Daniel chapter 7 anyway, about the thrones, the plural thrones in Daniel chapter 7. And um, uh, and what, and they would debate this because the Nazarenes, or the Menim, according to the Mishnah, <clears throat> taught that there were multiple powers in the heavens. You, you uh, um, this is all in our, our last study, so um, go back and review whatever you need to do. We covered it, and this should be ringing bells for you if you've been following along and absorbed the material. So uh, this is all, this is very well worded um, and it's very clear what it means and that it's referring to the very portions of the book of Enoch that we are studying right now, that we studied last week, and that we will be studying um, as we move along. In other words, you might get these weird messianic ideas, you know, that the Nazarene have gotten, the Nazarenes have gotten, that have led them astray. Um, okay. <clears throat> So now let's look at a contemporary testimony from two different uh, witnesses, if you will. You know, the Torah says that a matter is is uh, uh, confirmed by two witnesses. Um, these aren't Torah valid witnesses necessarily, because Tertullian's not Torah observant. But we have two witnesses. First, we have a second century. Tanim Rabbi and uh, Rabbi Shimon, okay, and now we have Tertullian, a second century church father, um, and well, he goes into the third century, so, uh, but roughly close to the same time period. Um, but since Enoch in the in the same scripture, he's still from the Tanim period because uh, he he died a little bit before the Mishnah, more than likely died close to the time the Mishnah was published. Okay, um, he writes Tertullian in uh, his book The Apparel of Women. He writes, but since Enoch in the name in the same scripture. <coughs> has preached likewise concerning the Lord, nothing at all must be rejected by us, which pertains to us. And we read that every scripture suitable for edification is divinely inspired. By the Jews, it may now seem to have been rejected for that very reason, just like all other portions nearly, which speak of Messiah. Let's pause there for a minute. So Tertullian, in his time period, Christians were still using it. But rabbinic Jews were not openly using it. Apparently from Shimon, we read that they were secretly using it, but they didn't want you to have it because you might get confused. Um, 
So by, uh, by the Jews, it may now seem to have been rejected for that very reason, just like all other portions nearly, which tell of Messiah. Well, this material sure tells of Messiah, doesn't it? It mentions Messiah by, by title specifically. I don't want to say by name, but by, by title specifically. <clears throat> Nor, of course, is this fact wonderful, literally surprising, uh, that they did not receive some scripture which spoke of him whom even in per, uh, who even in person speaking in their presence they were not to receive. To these considerations is added the fact that Enoch possesses a testimony in the Apostle Jude. So they're singing the same song. Uh, the uh, Tanim Shimon is saying the book of Enoch, we use it privately and secretly, but we don't, in fact, if I could, if I had the opportunity to keep it from being disseminated in the first place, I would have. Um, and, and it even says when the, the and uh, Rabbi Shimon even admits that Elohim, the Holy One, blessed be he, gave mankind the book of Enoch. Elohim gave mankind the book of Enoch. But if given the opportunity, if Shimon had been there, he would have tried to stop him. <laughs> Seriously, is what he's saying. Uh, because it's dangerous for you, because you may misinterpret it and think that it's teaching about these strange powers, i.e. a son of man being uh, um, a second person of the Godhead, if you will, um, and a Messiah that uh, uh, this messian messianic figure that sits on a throne at the right hand of, of Elohim. Okay. And Tertullian, the church father from the same time period, says, yeah, the Jews have rejected this book because it talks about the Messiah. <laughs> exactly the same thing. I mean, this is such a solid case. It's not even hard. It's not even difficult. It's a very solid case here. So Tertullian and, and uh, Shimon are singing the same song. They're uh, agreeing. So uh, Shimon ben Yechai admits that among the sages of rabbinic Judaism, the wise and under quote the wise who understand these things keep them secret and therefore fortify themselves in the service of their master. They think that these books were just meant for them, not for you. But that he endeavored to prevent uh, their uh, endeavored to prevent their dissemination. Because, as he says, not all wise men read them with proper attention and thus uh, extract themselves perverted ideas, such as the ideas about Yeshua, the Messiah. Uh, likewise, um, Tertullian says the Jews, it may now seem to have been rejected, just like all other portions, nearly, which tell of Messiah, which means Tertullian is telling us that there's other missing material that's been suppressed that we don't that we don't even have today that uh, uh, that was suppressed because it spoke of Messiah. Um, so now I want to talk about uh, pick up in the paragraph in recent years, Orthodox Jewish scholar Daniel uh, Boyarin. Um, in the handout, it says pictured at the top of this article because it was once an article, but that's it's not pictured because this is not an article. Um, this is the book, The Jewish Gospels by Daniel Bjarn. Bjarn is a great Talmudic uh, scholar. In fact, here, I'll just, um, the story, uh, he wrote the book, The Jewish Gospels, the story of uh, Jewish Christ. It takes a non-hostile approach to Yeshua and his original Jewish followers. But Yaron is not only a noted historian of religion, he's been called, quote, one of the two or three greatest rabbinic scholars in the world. Close quote. <clears throat> he holds dual United States and Israeli citizenship. 
Uh, he's trained as a Talmudic scholar. In 1990, he was appointed professor of Talmudic culture at the Department of Near Eastern Studies and Rhetoric, University of California, Berkeley, uh, post which I believe he still holds. Um, he opens the book with some very interesting words for us as Nazarenes, at least. Uh, for me, at least, as a Nazarene, people watching this video may or may not identify as Nazarenes. Um, but um, watch enough of these videos, you may, <laughs> if, you, if you don't already. But Yaren opens his book with some very interesting words. He says, um, and this is from uh, pages five through six, bottom of page six, top of page five, bottom of page five, top of page. So oh, it starts on page one, and then it skips to page five and six. Uh, if there is one thing that Christians know about their religion, it's that it's not Judaism. If there's one thing that Jews know about their faith, it's that it's not Christianity. If there's one thing that both groups know about this, double not, it's that Christians believe in the Trinity and the incarnation of Christ, um, the Greek word for Messiah, and Jews don't. The Jews keep kosher, and Christians don't. If only things were that simple. In this book, I'm going to tell a very different story. A story of a time when Jews and Christians were much more mixed up with each other than they are now. Whenever, when there were many Jews who believed in something quite like the Father and Son, even in something like the incarnation of the Son in the Messiah, and when followers of Jesus kept kosher laws, and accordingly a time in which the difference between Judaism and Christianity just didn't exist as it does now. I'm going to pause and comment in his quotation here. Some of us are restoring that time. <laughs> okay. Uh, he continues. I believe this is pay, skipping to page five. While by now almost everyone, Christian and non-Christian, is happy enough to refer to Jesus, the human, as a Jew, I want to go a step beyond that. I wish us to see that Christ, too, the divine Messiah, is a Jew. Christology or the early ideas about Christ is also a Jewish discourse, and not until much later an anti-Jewish discourse at all. Many Israelites at the time of Jesus were expecting a Messiah who would be divine and come to earth in the form of a human. Thus, the basic understanding, thoughts from which both the Trinity and the Incarnation grew, are there in the very world into which Jesus was born and in which he was first written about in the Gospels of Mark and John. Now, understand, this guy is an Orthodox Jew. He's a Talmudic scholar, one of the two or three top Talmudic scholars in the world. Um, and he's a um, uh, dual American Israeli citizen. And he's admitting these things. All right. Um, I think he uses the word Christian too loosely here. The original followers of Yeshua identify themselves as Jews and not as Christians. But it's very interesting that such an important Orthodox Jewish scholar is willing to admit that not only, not only were Yeshua's originally followers kosher eating and Torah observant, but that the doctrine of the deity of Messiah itself was of Jewish origin, uh, was held by the original Jewish followers of Yeshua from the very beginning, and has been rejected by rabbinic Judaism since the first century in a reactionary manner. <laughs> Imagine that. Uh, of course, those of us who are students of the Zohar um, already knew that. <laughs> uh, you know, when I was studying 
with Rabbi Moyal when I, early in my life as a believer in Messiah. Um, it was actually Rabbi Moyal that taught me the deity of the Messiah, and he did so with the Zohar and um, the rabbinic literature. Uh, I soon also discovered that it uh, could be shown from the scriptures themselves. But um, one of the things that uh, um, I learned to do was to understand the Zohar as the Zohar. Not, well, it's in the Zohar. What is even more interesting is that Bjarn has to say about the book of Enoch in this very regard. Bjarn's book is an entire ch has an entire chapter on the Son of Man figure as portrayed in the book of Enoch. By the way, the book also goes into um, the passage that we talked about where Yeshua combines in, in his trial, combines together um, Psalm 110 and Daniel 7.13 in an amalgamation and how that ties into all of this. But it's a whole book and we're not going to cover the whole book. We're just going to cover some highlights. But I recommend the book uh, for some historical background material. It also ties all this into to, uh, Second Esdras in the Apocrypha, uh, etc. Okay. Um, I don't think that everything he says is correct in the book, obviously, but it's got some really good information. Um, so here's what he says. Let's skip to page seven. Um, Bjarn says that the book of Enoch makes extensive use of the term son of man to refer to a particular divine human redeemer, which he says exhibits, quote, many of the elements of the Christ story. Uh, page 75. Uh, this book provides us with the most explicit, uh, this is Bjorn speaking, on page 76, talking about the book of Enoch. This book provides us with our most explicit evidence that the Son of Man is a divine human redeemer uh, arose by Jesus' time. He goes on to conclude on page 77, and I quote, What we learn from this is that there was controversy among Jews about the Son of Man long before the Gospels were written. Some Jews accepted and some rejected the idea of a divine Messiah. The similitudes, or the book of parables, the parables are the similitudes called either one, the similitudes of the book of Enoch are evidence for the tradition of the interpretation of the Son of Man as such a divine person the tradition that fed into the Jesus movement as well. It is only centuries later, of course, that the difference in belief would become the marker and touchstone of the difference between two religions. Then he writes, pages 77 and 78, in the book of Enoch, this figure is part of God as a second or junior divinity. He may even be considered a son alongside the Ancient of Days whom we might begin to think of as the Father. Although the Messiah designation appears elsewhere also, it is in Enoch 48, and the similarities to the gospel ideas about Jesus are most pronounced. Then he goes on to quote chapter 48, um, which we have read, and so uh, we read last week, actually, and I'm not going to reread chapter 48 for you, because um, we read it last week, and you have it available to you. It's here in the handout if you want to go back over it. Um, but Boyarin comments on this chapter, and this is what he says. First of all, we find the doctrine of the pre-existence of the Son of Man. He has names even before the universe came into being. Second, the Son of Man will be worshipped on earth. All who dwell on earth will fall down and worship before him, and they will glorify and bless and sing hymns to the name 
of Yahweh of hosts, or the Lord of spirits, which means, by the way, that he is the Yahweh of hosts, as I said. Uh, third, and perhaps most important of all, verse 10, he is named as the Anointed One, which is precisely the Messiah, Hebrew Mashiach, or Christ, in Greek Christos. It seems quite clear that many of the religious ideas that were held about the Messiah, who was identified as Yeshua, or as Jesus, were already present in Judaism, from which both the Enoch circle and the circles around Jesus emerged. That's page 80 of his book. Then he cites 1 Enoch chapter 69, verses 26 through 29, which I will read from uh, my own translation. Uh, because we have not read them yet. We will read them, but we haven't read them yet. <clears throat> and there was great joy among them, and they blessed and they glorified and extolled because the name of that Son of Man that had been revealed unto them. And he sat on the throne of his glory, and the sum of judgment was given unto the Son of Man, and he caused the sinners to pass away and be destroyed from the face of the earth, and those who have led the world astray. With chains shall they be bound, and in their assemblage place of destruction shall they be imprisoned, and all their works vanish from the face of the earth. And from henceforth there shall be nothing corruptible, for that Son of Man has appeared, and has seated himself on the throne of his glory, and all evil shall pass away from before his face, and the word of that Son of Man shall go forth and be strong before Yahweh Zavaot. And on page 81 of his book, Buyarin comments on these verses saying, Here the Son of Man is clearly occupying the throne of glory, seated perhaps at the right hand of the Ancient of Days. It is hard to escape the conclusion that the Son of Man is a second person, as it were, of God. And all the functions assigned to the divine figure called, quote, one like the Son of Man, close quote, in Daniel 7, are given to this Son of Man who is called, as we have seen, the Christ or the Messiah. Page 81. So here we have an Orthodox scholar who's admitted that the beliefs of the original followers of Yeshua concerning the Messiah were originally Jewish ideas long before the time uh, of Yeshua, and that the best evidence of this fact is the Book of Enoch. It's no surprise that by the second century, the rabbis began to suppress the Book of Enoch, thinking that only they had the ability to understand it without being drawn astray to follow after this Yeshua movement. So uh, the uh, book has now been restored to us, as in these last days, as Nazarene Judaism is also being restored, as proof that even an Orthodox, um, and as proof that even an Orthodox Jewish scholar can accept that our ideas concerning the Messiahship of Yeshua are authentically Jewish. All right. Let's pick back up with the Book of Enoch, but this is very important information. It tells us why the rabbis suppressed the Book of Enoch, why it is a it is a utterly Nazarene book pre-existed pre Nazarene Judaism. Nazarene Judaism was built upon its theology. Um, I would say built naturally flowed because it was scripture, is scripture. And it taught the things that we believe about the Messiah before there was a, a Christianity. That some who want to um, proto- neo ebionites for example, and others, uh, some uh, modern Christian groups that want to deny the deity of Messiah, um, uh, that want to, you know, uh, change some things up 
that claim that actually uh, some certain things were Christian inventions later. And here we have an Orthodox rabbi that's telling us, nope, it's all in the book of Enoch. It was all in the book of Enoch before Yeshua even came on the scene. And um, it was clearly and obviously the doctrine of theology of the original Jewish followers of Yeshua. And it was Jewish before it was co-opted by Christians. All right, back to the book of Enoch. This good stuff. Uh, chapter 51. And in those, and we're about to, to hit on one of the 128 uh, places where the book is practically quoted, the book of Revelation in this case, in the uh, so-called New Testament. And in those days shall the earth also give back that which has been entrusted to it, and Sheol shall also give back that which has been received, and hell will give back that which it owes. One uh, that's uh, being quoted in Revelation 2014. Let's read Revelation 2014 and I think you'll agree that that's close enough that we should really be calling it a quote. Revelation 2013. And that's the other evidence, by the way, the, uh, that Jude quotes the book of Enoch outright. The Revelation 2013 paraphrases at least the book of Enoch, and that there are 128 places at least that are H. Charles located in the so-called New Testament that are referencing material from the book of Enoch. And you bring that all together with what the book of Enoch actually teaches about the Messiah, and those that deny the deity of Messiah uh, have no leg to stand on, in the uh, at least uh, in the Yeshua accepting uh, aspect, because even before Yeshua came on the scene, the Judaism uh, that naturally flowed into Nazarene Judaism believed in the deity of Messiah. And we can show that because it's in the Book of Enoch, and the Book of Enoch is influencing throughout the so-called New Testament. All right, verse 13, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and uh, hell uh, delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Um, uh, whoever was not found in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire, and that whole reference back, actually goes back to verse 12. I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. That is Daniel 7.10. <sighs> Revelation 12, uh, 2012 is referencing Daniel 7.10. Uh, and the book of Enoch, <laughs> because the book of Enoch also says that the books were opened. And this very scene is a follow-up to the books being opened. So Revelation 20 verses... Um, 11 through 15 are outright referencing this same material in the book of Enoch. So don't think that the original followers of Yeshua didn't accept the book of Enoch, and if the original followers of Yeshua accepted the book of Enoch, they certainly accepted the deity of Messiah. All right. <clears throat> Back to chapter 51, verse 1. Uh, uh, we already read verse 1, which is uh, um, paralleling Revelation 20. And he shall choose the righteous and set apart from among them, for the day has drawn near when they should be saved. And the chosen one shall in those days sit on my throne, and his mouth shall pour forth all the secrets of wisdom and counsel, for Yahweh Zavaot has given them to him and has glorified him. And in those days shall the mountains leap like rams, and hills also shall skip like lambs. And satisfied with milk, and the faces of all the angels in heaven shall be lighted up with joy. For in those days the chosen one shall arise, and the earth shall rejoice, and the righteous shall dwell on it, and the chosen shall walk thereon. Chapter 52. 
And we have another handout that goes with chapter 52. I went my whistler again. Okay. Uh, so pull out your next handout. It's a nice little chart. And on the six metal mountains in First Enoch 52.2 and in 67.4. 67.4 flashes back to First Enoch 52.2. And it gives a much abridged version, so it doesn't include the whole list, but includes things on the list. One thing on the list that isn't found in um, First Enoch 52, which means it's probably there's a scribal error and there's actually seven metal mountains, uh, which makes much more sense in First Enoch 52. And the uh, text says it's come down to us only has six. And wonderfully, in some future edition, we can start to work to restore the Book of Enoch because First Enoch 67.4 gives us the information to restore 52. All right, uh, verse 1. And after those days, in that place there, I had seen all the visions of which is hidden, for I had been carried off in a whirlwind, and they had borne me towards the west. There my eyes saw all the secret things of heaven that shall be. A mountain of iron and a mountain of copper and a mountain of silver and a mountain of gold and a mountain of soft metal and a mountain of lead and missing from the list but found in First Enoch 67.4 is a mountain of ten. <clears throat> um, so the question is, what is the soft metal? Well, if the soft metal is um, maybe quicksilver, I think it's quicksilver, which is, uh, or mercury, which is a liquid, so that's pretty soft. Um, and uh, that creates uh, a very good parallel of some things that we'll talk about here in a minute. It's in the chart. And I asked the, uh, verse three, I asked the angel who went with me saying, what things are these things which I have seen in secret? And he said unto me, All these things which you have seen shall serve the dominion of his Messiah, that he may be potent and mighty on the earth. And that angel of Shalom answered, saying unto me, Wait a little, and there shall be revealed unto you all the secret things which surround Yahweh Zavaot. Let's pause there for a minute. Let's... Um, go over this chart before we pick up into verse 6. So in this chart, I've got the seven metals. The seven metals by transplanting the tin that's missing from the list, but does appear in 1st Enoch 67.4. Now 67.4 is truncated, so it doesn't mention the copper, the silver, um, or the lead. Um, so if we compare the two, though, we can get a complete list, as you see here in the chart. Now, the reason it's significant is that these are the seven metals that the ancients associated with the seven visible planets. Now, notice I said planets in quotes, because the ancients, particularly the ancient Hebrews, referred to the sun, moon, and five visible planets as wandering stars. Um, in fact, whenever you read five, seven stars, and we talked about this, I think, in a previous study on the, in the book, when you ever see this phrase, seven stars, it's a, re a, a reference to the sun, moon, and seven visible planets. All heavenly bodies were called kakavim, stars, we translate, but really means heavenly bodies. Um, and um, uh, including the sun, moon, and five visible planets. Now you notice that if you have the sun, moon, and five visible planets, you have seven. And seven is an important number in the Bible. Um, and these each correspond, iron corresponds with Mars, copper, they correspond to the uh, pagan gods associated with each of the planets. So the pagan god Mars was associated with iron. Uh, and 
Uh, that's why Mars, the red planet, is was because of iron uh, being associated with red because it rusts red. Um, was uh, um, ma called Mars. Now, interestingly, it's uh, the same reason that Mars is red <laughs> because of the iron uh, that has oxidized and created that reddish color. Um, interestingly, also, uh, the Hebrews called Mars um, blood, the blood planet. And blood is also red because it's oxidized iron. <laughs> so uh, that, that's all very it's kind of interesting parallel. So um, we'll get to, uh, to the, uh, the, well, let's cover the four, four kingdoms at the same time. So in Daniel chapter 2, which parallels Daniel chapter 7, where we also see the... Um, the Son of Man in the Ancient of Days. We have four kingdoms, and the four kingdoms are each associated with one of these metals, in that they're each associated with one of these pagan gods. And they're also associated with one of these metals in Daniel chapter 2 in the statue, uh, the image of the man. Uh, so iron is associated with Mars, and Mars was worshipped by Rome, the god of war. Uh, copper is associated with, by the ancients, with the goddess of Venus, and uh, Aphrodite in the Greek pantheon, and she was the goddess of the Greek, primary goddess of the Greeks. Gold was, oh sorry, silver was associated with the moon, and the moon was the uh, moon god was the primary deity of the Persians and Persia. Gold was the uh, uh, was associated by the ancients with the sun, and the sun sun god was the primary deity of Babylon. So for the first four of these, we have. Um, metal mountains, and that's interesting because in Daniel, a mountain represents a kingdom. So, uh, we have this mountain kingdom association, and we have four of these metals associated with four ancient kingdoms that are specifically addressed in Daniel 2 slash Daniel 7, which run parallel to each other. And so, we can see where Daniel 7, using the Book of Enoch, got the four metals and this association into Daniel 2. Okay. So Daniel knew the Book of Enoch. And perhaps that helped him interpret Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Okay. Um, then we have soft metal or quicksilver, which... Uh, it's also called Mercury, which is associated with Mercury. Now, interestingly, uh, the Roman god Mercury, who was associated with the, with, he was called by the Greeks Hermes, and was associated also with the Egyptian god Thoth, or Toth, was associated with Enoch himself, um, as I think we've covered before. Um there's some really good, strong evidence for this, including the fact that uh, Enoch is the scribe um, of, uh, of God and the planet Mercury is called in the Talmud the scribe of the sun. There's, there's a lot of evidence to support it. Okay. Um, the ancients associated lead with the planet Saturn or with, well, the planet Saturn and with the, with, I won't say the god Saturn, actually the Titan Saturn and 10 with the god Jupiter or Zeus. Saturn was Kronos to the Greeks, and Jupiter or Zeus to the Greeks uh, was associated with 10 uh, by the ancients in their alchemy. Okay, so uh, these we can see how these uh, seven metal mountains can associate with kingdoms, at least four of them. 
Verse 6, And these mountains which your eyes have seen, the mountain of iron, and the mountain of copper, and the mountain of silver, and the mountain of gold, and the mountain of soft metal, and the mountain of lead, all these shall be in the presence of the chosen one as wax. So the kingdoms that melt, the mountains that melt before him. And that fits well with what's happening in Daniel chapter 7. Uh, they fall to the Son of Man. And in Daniel chapter 2, the stone that uh, uh, destroys the image of the man. And like the water which streams down from above upon those mountains, they shall become powerless before his feet. And it shall come to pass in those days that none shall be saved either by gold or by silver, and none be able to escape. Not by literal gold and silver, although that will be true too, but by king, earthly kingdoms, earthly governments. And there shall be no iron for war, nor shall, there, shall one clothe himself with a breastplate. Bronze shall be of no service, and tin shall be of no service, and shall be not be esteemed, and lead shall not be desired. And all these things shall be denied and destroyed from the surface of the earth, when the chosen one shall appear both for the face of Yahweh Zavot. Verse chapter 53. There my eyes saw a deep valley with open mouths, and all who dwell on the earth. Um, sorry. Um, and sea and islands shall bring to him gifts and presents and tokens of homage, and that deep valley shall not become full. And their hands commit lawless deeds, and the sinners devour all whom they lawlessly oppress. Yet the sinners shall be destroyed before the face of Yahweh Zavaot, and they shall be banished from off the face of his earth, and they shall perish forever and ever. Their bribes won't do them any good. They won't be able to buy salvation with them. For I saw all the angels of punishment abiding there and preparing all the instruments of Hasatan. And I asked the angel of Shalom who went with me, for whom are they preparing these instruments? And he said to me, they are preparing these for the kings and the mighty of this earth, that they may thereby be destroyed. And after this, the righteous one, the righteous and chosen one, shall cause the house of his congregation to appear. Henceforth they shall no more uh, hindered in the name of Yahweh Zavaot. And these mountains shall not stand as the earth before his righteousness, but the hills shall be as fountains of water, and the righteous shall have rest from the oppression of sinners. Chapter 54. And I looked, and I turned another part of the earth, and I saw there a deep valley with burning fire, uh, Gihanam, as we discussed in chapter 17. And they brought the kings and the mighty and began to cast them into this deep valley. And there my eye saw how they made their instruments iron chains of immersible, Im immeasurable weight. And I asked the angel of Shalom, who went with me, saying, for whom are these chains being prepared? And he said to me, these are being prepared for the hosts of Azazel. Hadn't heard about him in a little bit, but now uh, it picks back up with him in the book of Enoch. They're prepared for the hosts of Azazel so that they may take them and cast them into the abyss and complete condemnation, and they shall cover their jaws with rough stones as Yahweh Zavaot commanded. And Michael and, Raph and Gavriel and Raphael and Penuel shall take hold of them on that great day and cast them on that day into the burning furnace that Yahweh Zavaot may take vengeance on them for their unrighteousness in becoming subject to Hasatan and letting, leading astray those who dwell on the earth. And in those days shall punishment 
come from Yahweh Zavaot, and he will open all the chambers of waters which are above the heavens, and all the fountains which are beneath the earth, and all the waters shall be joined with the waters which are in the heavens, in the masculine, and the water which is beneath the earth is feminine, and they shall destroy all those who dwell on the earth, and those who dwell under the earth, and of the heaven, and when they have recognized the unrighteousness which they have wrought on earth, then by these shall they perish. That's, of course, a prophecy of the flood, which was still future to Enoch. Chapter 55. And after that, the ancient of days repented and said, In vain have I destroyed all who dwell on the earth. And he swore by his great name, Henceforth I will not do, it, do so to all who dwell on the earth, and I will set a sign in heaven, and this shall be a pledge of good faith between me and them forever, as long as heaven is above the earth, and this is in accordance with my command. Of course, we see this in, in uh, Genesis, uh, the rainbow, the origin of the rainbow. When I have desired to take hold of them by the hand of the angels on the day of tribulation and pain, because of this I will cause my chastisement and my wrath to abide upon them, says Yahweh Zavot. You mighty kings who dwell on the earth, you shall have to behold my chosen one, how he sits on the throne of glory and judges Azazel and all his associates and all the hosts in the name of Yahweh Zavaot. Chapter 56. And I saw there the hosts of the angels of punishment going, and they held scourges and chains of iron and bronze. And I asked the angel of Shalom, who went with me, saying, To whom are these going who hold the scourges? And he said to me, To their chosen and beloved ones, that they may be cast into the chasm of the abyss of the valley. And then that valley shall be filled with their chosen and beloved, and the days of their lives shall be at an end, and the days of their leading astray shall not henceforth be reckoned. And in those days, the angels shall return. This is important, folks. Uh, just like Yeshua said, the last days would be like in the days of Noah. Because in those days, the angels fell. That's going to happen again. It's not going to happen again. They're going to return. In those days, the angels shall return and hurl themselves to the east upon the Parthians and the Medes. Who are the Parthians and the Medes? Well, today, they're the Iranians. Just saying. They shall stir up the king, so the spirit of unrest shall come upon them, and they shall rouse them from their thrones, that they may break forth as lions from their lairs, and as hungry wolves among their flocks. And they shall go up and tread underfoot the land of his chosen ones. The land of his chosen ones. Israel? Iran attacks Israel? Interesting. And the land of his chosen one shall be before them a threshing floor and a highway. But the city of my righteous shall be a hindrance to their horses, and they shall begin to find themselves, fight them, uh, among themselves and their right hand shall be strong against themselves, and a man shall not know his brother, nor son his father, or his mother, till there be no number of the corpses through their slaughter, and their punishment be not in vain. In those days Shaol shall not open its jaws, shall open its jaws, I'm sorry, and they shall be swallowed up henceforth, and their destruction shall be at an end. Shaol shall devour the sinners in the presence of the chosen. So Yahweh is going to intervene. Verse 50, chapter 57, when we wrap it up, uh, the last three verses here for, for this week. And it came to pass after this that I saw another host of chariots and men riding thereon and coming on the winds of the east and from the west to the south. And the, and the noise of their chariots was heard 
And when this turmoil took place, the set-apart ones from heaven remar remarked it, and the pillars of the earth were moved from their place, and the sound thereof was heard from one end of heaven to the other in one day. And they shall fall down and worship Yahweh Zavaot, and this is the end of the second parable. And it's the end of our study this week. We will pick up next week with the third parable and chapter 58. It's getting good, and it gets even better. It's a very interesting book, and um, now I think you're seeing why the rabbis suppressed it, why the, the, uh, the church ultimately suppressed it, and why it's come back to us in the last days, and um, why it's so important for believers living in this period of time to know and understand this book, and why it's an important part also of the restoration of the ancient sect of the Nazarenes. All right. Shalom, everybody, and uh, we'll pick up next week.